Want to live a life of significance? Guess what? You can. The choice is yours. Welcome to the Duke University Life of Significance series, where we will help you do just that. I'm Sun Yin Shang, your host for the series. I work on helping individuals and teams discover and apply their superpowers. And I lead the Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. And I'm ranked by Thinkers50 as the world's number one leadership coach. For this episode, we have an amazing co-host. It's Pal Gasol, who is also a distinguished fellow at our leadership center. Pal is a six-time MBA All-Star and a two-time MBA champion. And he's also an Olympian. Now, Pal lives that life of significance because whether it's about helping to eliminate childhood obesity through the Gasol Foundation or helping children thrive as a UNICEF ambassador, he is always using his platform, his reach to make a positive difference in the world. And our guest today is Marley Diaz. When Marley was 10, Marley founded the 1000 Black Girl Books. Um, it's an entire movement in response to see, seeing a lack of black female protagonists in books. So her goal was to collect and donate 1000 books in which black girls are the main characters. And to date, Marley has collected over 12,000 books for her campaign. And she has also released a book called Marley Diaz Gets It Done and So Can You. Marley has inspired so many around the world, including me. And we feel so lucky to have her share her story with us today. So Pal, we'll toss it to you for the first question. All right, oh, well, thank you Sanyin uh, for the opportunity. I'm very excited to talk to Marley and get to know her story. And, um, and my first question would be, what, what does it mean to you Marley to, to live a life of significance? Well, it means a lot to me, especially because I'm only 16. So I think thinking about my life in like a, a super large sense or that I'm, you know, I've done so many things that and accomplished so much is really important to me. I think because my audience is mainly, you know, kids my age and kids younger than me, I really try to encourage the model that we don't have to wait until we grow up to care about others, to want to change the world, to want to be an astronaut or a model or an athlete or an activist, that all these things are achievable in a, a small or large way. Uh, whether you're younger or older. So when it comes to thinking about, you know, living a life of significance, thinking that that can start at any point in your life and that there isn't, you know, I don't have to wait until I graduate college or until I've uh, done a certain thing or met a certain person that I can help others be kind, be compassionate um, and do things that make the world a better place. That's amazing. That's amazing. And so when we think about that, um, who are some of your role models? Who in your life is leading and living a life of significance? Well, I would obviously have to say my mom because she helps me so much with everything I do. She's actually led and started the conversation that uh, led to me starting 1000 Black Girl Books because she challenged me to do something about my personal frustration. As you can see behind me, I love to read. I've always loved to read. Um, and some of these books I've had since I was born or before I was born. Um, and she always encouraged me to think critically about the world and to use reading as a way to, to have the words to talk about my feelings, my experiences, and really being an avid reader, I think helped a lot in starting 1000 Black Girl Books as a social activist and wanting to help others. So she asked me what I was gonna do about it after I complained that I didn't see myself. So she made me take that next step rather than just going to the bookstore and buying books for myself, thinking about how this impacts my friends, my peers, my teachers, my school, and then kind of the world at large. So I say that I, I definitely look up to my mom in that respect, but I, she learned a lot of this from her grandmother. So I look up to her as well, although I never got to meet her. I think that she has taught her uh, so much of these ideas to care about community, to want to build community. And that's really what 1000 Black Girl Books come from is the idea that all communities and the stories of each community member should be valued equally and should be told equally. So I think it comes from my mom, but also from the lessons she was taught by my great grandmother. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And I think I think there's something a, a, a lot to be said, actually, from appreciating the people that came before us. Right. And the people that we have learned from, they have learned from someone else. Right. So our moms, our grandmas, they are thankful, I'm sure. And they had their role models just as we do. And it's just like your mom has provided so much for you and so much inspiration and motivation. She gets she got it from her mother, your grandma, and probably her grandmother had a huge, or the mother of your grandmother had a huge influence on her, on her as well. So 
uh, it's, it's just so important to, to appreciate the ones that have done it and have been there before us. Um, and I also love that you're an avid reader. I'm, I'm also an avid reader. And it's so it's just knowledge is power. There's no way to, to sugarcoat it or to put it in any other way. Uh, I think and there's so much to be learned. In order to improve what we have going on in our lives today, we have to know what's being done. What's be, what, we'll learn from the mistakes that, that previous people have made before us. And if we really want to, to change things up and to improve things as, as we are today, we, we got to learn, right? And, and there's, there's no better way of learning than, than reading. So uh, I, I want to commend you because I know I wasn't an avid reader when I was your age. Uh, I started off a lot later. Um, yes, I read the, sc the, the school books and I did my homework and I was pretty good at school because I wanted to make my, my parents proud. But uh, I didn't start really digging into reading until in my 20s. So, uh, so I want to commend you for that. And, um, you know, you're, you're an inspiration. That's so beautiful, pal. And I love the way you encapsulated that. And Marley, what you said, it reminds me of this line that we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, right? And so we have a responsibility to them, those who have come before us and paved the way for us to also pave the way for others. And there's something about what you said about caring for others in terms of living a life of significance. So what your mom gave you is the sense of agency that no matter that life of significance is independent of age, you start today, you know, but Let's take you back to when you were age 10. She, you were frustrated and she tossed you a challenge. But it could be really overwhelming or daunting to even move forward on it. So what gave you courage? Well, I think she gave me courage. And I, I think one thing that she always does a great job of is, you know, the title activist has kind of come to me through the uh, more global recognition of my work. But when I started 1000 Black Girl Books, I didn't know I was an activist. I didn't know that I was like a literary advocate. I didn't know that I was an agent for change. That rather I was working to solve a problem. And I think kind of the goal, especially when I talk to younger kids, is to make sure that they understand that obviously I have like a fancy title that helps people understand what I do, but it's really about solving problems. So she had encouraged me to do that with small things, whether it was not liking the food I had for lunch or wanting to wear a different outfit to school, that I would always work towards slowly just solving a problem one at a time. So then when you get to a step where you see like a big problem, like not feeling like your voice is being heard in school, not feeling like your story is being told, then I didn't feel like it was as big of a step because I'd always been solving like little problems left and right. And that I, I had choice in a lot of the things that I wanted to do. So encouraging parents to when their kid complains about something large or small to ask them to work to solve it rather than get rid of it is something that I try to focus on, you know, emphasizing for especially younger kids. So that it doesn't feel like when I want to help other people, it's uh, so different from wanting to help myself. And so for listeners out there, take note, it starts in the small moments. You know, uh, living a life of significance has to do with problem solving. It starts in the small moments and creating that habit of solving problems and having a sense of agency so that you're ready in the big moments when the world calls you to do so. Uh, Marley, what, what was that process for you like? Because uh, you, you identified something that was upsetting you or was or you thought was was wrong and you wanted to, to change it. So how, and then your mom encouraged you, gave you that courage. Uh, what was that process like? It was like, okay, okay what, are, what are we gonna do about it, right? Uh, how are we gonna start? And how, tell us about that process of, because sometimes things upset us or things, and you say, well, they're just the way they are, you know, what, what am I gonna do? But how do you tell people out there, other kids or adults to, to take action and where, where, where to start? So the first thing we kind of did after that, like, is understanding that this might just not happen to me. So we wanted to make sure that the issue of lack of diversity wasn't just my school, that maybe maybe this is just something that happens to me. Maybe I'm like a little crazy for noticing it. But yeah. what she encouraged me to do was we would look up videos, learning about like diversity in kids books. We would notice what was on my bookshelves. I would pay more attention to the books I was reading in school. So she was just encouraging me to think more critically and to start to like draw those comparisons in my head. So I wanted to make sure that this wasn't just an issue I faced in my school district or by myself, but that maybe there were other people in the United States or in the world that can relate to this issue. 
So once I was able to learn more about, you know, the amount of books that were published that had Black main characters, wh whether it was books that were published about girls, um, kind of figuring out and, and understanding more about uh, where my story fit into the world and how my story was being kind of brought to school was something that was really important. And then we had to figure out how does this passion for reading and this frustration connect and help others? So I decided that I was going to try to donate books to a school in Jamaica that my mom had attended because I felt like even though I wanted to give it to my school and, you know, help the people I knew, I thought maybe if I am going into this all black and, and majority black space like Jamaica, that we can help black girls that look like me understand that they matter in a space where even though there are always black people around them, the books they read don't show their, their experiences and that they don't feel represented in school. So um, she chose Jamaica first. She was like, maybe we should do something here. And then I realized, why not just do it to the school you went to? Because she had the same problem and my, my parents had the same problem on both sides of my family. So we tried to pick a place that meant a lot to me, but wasn't necessarily just to fix my issue. So I didn't go to that school. I didn't know those teachers. I didn't know those students, but I connected with them, that I was proud to be Jamaican. I was proud to love to read and I liked school and doing something that still was connected to who I am, but wasn't necessarily just to make sure that my problem was solved. Um, and making sure that it's always about community, whether it's my, you know, my best friend's school or anything like that, but reaching out as far as I can and understanding that the problem exists worldwide rather than just for me. I feel that there's so much there, Marley. I think there's so many great messages there because I think the process, it becomes, it's like, okay, let's, let's be aware of what's going on. Let's educate ourselves. And I think that what your mom told you, let's watch videos, let's, let's look for books and let's just understand what's, what's happening. And then you take it to, okay, am I alone in this? Or, or I have a feeling that there's many other kids out there that feel the same way. And, and I think that that's also very important. And then I think the next, the next point that I love to highlight there is like, to make sure and make people feel that everyone matters. I think that that's so important. And that you started with your mom's school in Jamaica. I think it's incredible. Uh, I think it's, um, it's something that, um, that ties in with your mom and your roots, but at the same time, it's not directly benefiting your classmates or your school or your community that you live in right now. So it's appreciating again, where you come from uh, and then benefiting people that you don't really know directly. So caring for others, uh, which is I think largely what we're talking about here about living a life of significance, helping others, making them feel that like they matter uh, without having to know them personally. So I think that that's, uh, that's just fantastic. And I just wanna acknowledge that. I appreciate it, thank you. Your focus on community is wonderful. So let's bring it back to you a little bit more. You are not the same person when you started on this process than you are now. What did you discover about yourself that surprised you? Perhaps new superpowers and how are you transformed? I think uh, throughout the, the process and, and journey of 1000 Black Girl Books, which isn't over, but obviously is now I feel like I'm older. I definitely have aged, uh, you know, both ment mentally and emotionally. But um, especially as my campaign began to pick up steam and I'd come out with a book, I felt very that I wanted to be very private in my own school about what I did. I didn't want to talk to my teachers about it. I didn't want to share everything with my friends. I didn't want to stand out in that way because I felt like as soon as I left school, I stood out everywhere else. Like I would, I would be asked the same questions. I would go places and I'd have to dress up and, you know, talk to the, talk to the world about my personal experiences. So I tried to separate you know, my experience in school from my experience at work or outside of school, uh, especially because I had now developed like a larger social media following and all these things. And my campaign had started because of a problem I had in school and it was because of my teacher. So I didn't always want him to know that he was the reason why I had, you know, done all these things. I didn't want him to feel bad. Um, and as time kind of passed and progressed, I still wanted to keep a lot of my ideas to myself. And I think it was because I, I'd always felt, uh, different in that respect that I wanted to do things that kids weren't supposed to do uh whether that was I wanted to travel a lot I wanted to go I want I didn't want to be in school every day I wanted to go out and take new experiences outside of school I wanted to wear my hair in an afro I wanted to do you know things that a lot of other girls and, and kids my age weren't necessarily interested in or didn't have the same access to so when I got to middle school I felt like maybe 1000 black girl books is just something I do for other people it's not something that I can prioritize for myself or really take the time to invest in in school because it was just tiring. Like, you know, I'm spending a lot of time out of school. I'm always working to 
talk either talk about myself or donate books and all these other things. So I think over the course of the campaign, I felt kind of a lot of internal shame about being different from others and missing school and, you know, missing my eighth grade dance or whatever. And I don't care about those things, but it was a long process, especially through the kind of sixth grade to uh, ninth grade. I felt a lot of internal kind of struggle with that. But now I feel so much better, especially because we're online. I get to do things like this and I don't have to worry about missing my friends or missing out on something. But, and I've grown from that, but it was a, a struggle for a while. You know, there's a sacrifice element to when we want to make a big difference in the world, right? Because there's, and Pal and I, we have talked about this a lot. It's the tension between what we're called to do, but then also curating, um, fostering the relationships that are most meaningful and closest to us, like our family and our dear friends. So when you were going through those struggles um, in the sixth to ninth grade, pre-pandemic, what were some of the things that helped you through that? Now, how did you maintain that balance? I don't think I was maintaining a balance, I'll be honest. But the one way that I was able to recover was really, I think, being more open with my friends. Sorry, my dog. Uh, one way I was able to recover was being more open with my friends and talking to them about it. I think as we uh, grew more mature and kind of whether racial politics or activism had become more popular on social media and now everyone was able to form their own opinions and they weren't as you know affected by their parents and they could read the news for themselves and they could see me for what I do and relate to it more. Uh, I felt like it was a much safer space for me because when I was in sixth grade and seventh grade, a lot of other kids didn't know who these news reporter was. They didn't know what these you know articles were. They didn't know what list or award I had received and its significance. So it just felt very out of context for a lot of other people. And for me as well, like I didn't know it was so cool to do all these things and travel all these places because not every seventh grader or sixth grader gets to do that. So as I got older, I think people started to understand that uh, and see the significance of these acts because they are maturing in that same way. So as you get older, you start to realize hey, maybe it was not that, like, it wasn't that big of a deal that she missed this or she did that. Um, and seeing the people that I've been able to meet, to interview the things I've written, the book I've published, you know, the show I've created, like, all these things now I think are, are making a lot more sense to people. But I wasn't going to let them, you know, relating to it or not affect my, my goal and never stop me from doing 1,000 Black Girl books. But it did stop my and limit my comfort level in wanting to share my achievements with others because I didn't think they understood it. And I spent so much time explaining why it mattered to people on news or on television or social media that I didn't want to do that at school. So that's really kind of why I kept things inside is I was tired of explaining why my story mattered, why activism mattered. And doing that at school was just too uh, laborious for me. So I think it's, it's so important um, and it's so great for, your, for me and for us to hear, um, you know, have you had... I think the, the courage as well to, to stay true to yourself and to your dream and your vision, which is something that sometimes uh, because of how things have been built around us, uh, we, we feel awkward that we don't fit in, right? Uh, so for you to stay true and not allow all these probably people, distractions uh, on the outside to deter you from your from your dream, from what you believe in, from how you felt and how you feel, I think it's very important uh, to share. Um, so I just want to say that, and because um, I, I myself, I wanted to be a basketball player. Um, I had to make sacrifices as well. Uh, I didn't have a normal childhood. I missed my graduation, my high school graduation, because I was playing a tournament in the southern islands of Spain, um, and I was fine with that. Uh, I was like, oh, how can you miss your graduation? I was like, well, I'm, I'm doing what I love. Uh, it's okay. I'm a dancer and a graduation. It's, it's not a big deal to me. I have, I have bigger goals. I don't know. I, I just, that's how I felt. I felt confident about what I was pursuing. And I didn't want anyone to dictate what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, so and I think that that's how you, you achieve exceptional things. And that's, I think that that's what you're doing. I mean, the fact that you have published a book and you created a show and you have interviewed, I'm sure, amazing people. Uh, it's, it's incredible, right? And if you can do it, I think you're opening all the kids' eyes to say, hey, if Marley has done it, why can I? You know, I feel a similar way or the exact same way. And maybe it might not be the same cause or, or, or reason or purpose, but it might be something 
just as exciting and just as important. So why not? Why not start today? And and to have the support of your parents is just so critical, right? I think that your mom has been there all along and 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 helped you through that. It's to me, my parents have been my pillar, my my strength. Even when I was drafted uh, in the NBA. And I, I had to come to the States for the first time. And I, we, I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, which I, I didn't know. Uh, and I didn't know how to speak English very well. My family acknowledged that and said, hey, we're coming with you. My parents left their work. My brothers changed schools. They flew ac- across the, the, the country, uh, the world. And, and, and that's why I succeeded as well, because I had their support, unconditional, loyal. And that's what, uh, that's what family is about. And that's, uh, there's no secret to that, I think. Yeah, my mom, she doesn't under she didn't really understand why I cared about those things because she didn't go to high school here or middle school here. She immigrated from Jamaica when she was 13. So mm-hmm. and then she went to like a private magnet school where every kid there was like her. Like they understood why these things would uh would have mattered. But I have gone to public school my whole life. I've grown up with these kids, and then all of a sudden I'm thrust away and I'm missing 60 days of school, and then I'm on the news, and and you know all these things felt like a, a completely different shift for me. But for her, she grew up grown up in a space where kids could you know think more freely and creatively, or even if they weren't allowed to, she would do it anyway. So she had always felt that it didn't really matter and that it wasn't going to matter in the end. But because especially coming from my dad, who's lived here his whole life, gone through those things, had those moments. Uh, it was difficult to balance understanding what matters versus what doesn't matter. Should I feel bad for missing something? Should I want to, you know, sacrifice going to some event or meeting another person uh, for my dance, for my, you know, uh, graduation and things like that. But we were able to find a good balance in the end. And I kind of regret wasting so much time being anxious about those things because now I don't feel anxious about them. And I look back on my middle school experience and even now my high school experience as a positive thing. You know, I see that balance is an important thing and a special thing that a lot of other people don't, you know, have the access or opportunity to and getting to make the right choices, even when it was hard is something that I, I don't regret and I, I feel happy about now, but I felt so stressed and, you know, so worried about in those moments. Marley, um, you know, you've, you've inspired and helped so many people. And, and I think one of the ways, especially like with your book is giving them that sense of agency, you know, and to say to others who are, who are teenagers, to say, you don't have to wait until you're older, you can start now. Who are some of the people you've met in your travels that have really like spoken to you that, you know, their stories have felt compelling for you? I think one of the um, most spectacular and important uh, moments of my career is working with, um, and I say career, like it's, it's not over, but one of the moments that happened to me so far is working with people from the United State of Women. So under the Obama administration, I got to work with people that were like Valerie Jarrett, Tina Chen, who were aides to uh, President Obama, Michelle Obama, and all the amazing women there that really supported me in those moments. And I am so happy now to see that um, that they were work- they're working on you know other campaigns for people that are running for public office they're running themselves um, and to I watch them as people that work in corporate they work in offices they work for the president of the United States to want to bring me to conferences to have me on panels and I often spend a lot of time being the youngest but they were always the people that took a chance on me and were willing to you know let me be the 12 year old on a panel of 30 and 40 year olds and saw that as a great and exciting thing. They didn't see that as, you know, she's too little, she's too young, she's too any of these things. They saw me as enough. Um, And all those women that worked uh, and have worked under there and allowed me to be on those panels, to talk to people, to then end up getting to interview former Secretary of State and First Lady Hillary Clinton, you know, to have her do things like that is, um, it's because of them and because of them saying, kids can be here. Like, I know this is supposed to be the most professional office in the world, but kid can equal professional. You know, I can do these things. And, and for them to allow me to do that is something that means so much to me. And I think has catapulted me into um, kind of different spaces and levels and opportunities that wouldn't have existed without them. Oh, that's, that's amazing. I think that that's all also, I think what you're doing about being thankful and recognizing and acknowledging the people that, that gave you a shot, right? That embraced you. Uh, that took you in, uh, that make you feel like you mattered uh, and that you were just as important and as cool as a 30 or 40 year old speaker, uh, right? Or so I think that, that that's also so, so important, uh, you know, for, for people out there to understand um, 
sometimes it's just you just need someone to to lean a hand or to to embrace you or to give you a shot right and to make you feel like hey you yeah you got it this is a uh, you can you can do this and so i and, and then it just gives you that that sense of confidence hey I'm, i don't know that's a validation even right you feel like hey i, I can do it she thinks or he thinks i can do it let me let me so because i think i think that there's something there and i've i felt that throughout my career especially when i was younger when i was still like okay well maybe maybe not or you know i i believe that i can but until a coach gave me a chance to play my to to practice with a professional team in barcelona in spain you know i i felt like i could but until he gave me a shot i couldn't really prove it you know uh until i was drafted in the nba i couldn't really play in the nba you always need that someone to take a chance and then it's incredible the effect that that has uh on, on people uh hey they, you you know you trust on me you believe in me i'm going to i'm not going to let you down and you have done i think so well you proven them all right right and it's fantastic it's so uh i think it's so great so marley um you're only 16 what's next what do you see Now, I a- am not sure what is next. I think that's an interesting question now because um when I started this there wasn't any thought about college or anything like that, but now I'm approaching, you know, I have one year until I go to college. So, it's crazy to think about. It's crazy to think about, you know, the places that I will be in the next, you know, 18 months and and the new experiences that will happen for me, but You know, 1000 Black Girl Books doesn't end here. Um and I think that for a lot of people they might be surprised by that because they think that my life is is going to change as it will, but the whole campaign is about change. It's anticipated that things will change and that's what it, we're hoping to embrace. So we've now collected, you know, over 12,000 books like you said. We're heading on to 13,000. We're like 13,001. So I'm very happy, you know, to talk about that. Uh but that we will continue to donate these books and you know uh, working on projects like a, a show I did with Netflix called Bookmarks which is a a read aloud series with celebrities like Lupita Nyong'o, Jacqueline Woodson, Marcy Martin, really amazing black actors reading stories um about black children and their experiences is something that we hope to do. So moving a little bit, you know, farther away from just donating books and doing things like that, but focusing on developing creative projects, initiative initiatives and helping other young kids that are interested in social activism. Because my perspective is not the perspective of 10-year-olds anymore. They see the world differently. They are experiencing new movements, new, you know, campaigns and it's weird to think that I might not understand what a 10-year-old is going through. but i don't you know now it's interesting i'm not a, i'm a teenager now i'm moving on towards you know young adulthood so continuing to be a support system and being more active especially with other young people that have kind of been inspired by me or have heard of me um and want support from people like me is what we're hoping to do in the future and my mom has a book coming out in the future so hoping to see that new young uh new young girls will be helped uh through parenting like it matters which is the title of her book that will now be interested in social activism will now have the tools and resources so that's coming out soon but i'm excited to see what will come out of you know her talking about my experience and her experience like i said with her grandmother um and bringing out and hopefully creating uh, some new girls that you know can change the world and can start really awesome campaigns that's wonderful how do you have any uh parting questions No, I mean I just um one thing that I that one of the biggest challenges that I've had and and that some people have even if you're following your true passion and you're uh really excited about your dream and vision is how do you deal and manage all the attention, right? Because it's uh it, yes, it's it's hard to do. It's hard to to manage um because you you don't know how people feel like and they, people don't really know you know you, right? But you're getting all these acclamation uh all this uh highlight that uh that you just doing something that is true to you and that you believe in right so how do you deal with with the, your social media increasing how do you uh deal with uh interviews or or and so forth and opportunities that you have to say yes and you have to say no right so how do you how do you deal with that i'm i'm obviously i'm sure that your mom is a huge support in your family but like how do you personally deal with it 
Well, it's definitely tough, but I feel like I've gotten better at it. You know, I, I am a student and then I also have like my own job because I'm a teenager. I wanted to get my first job and all this stuff. Like, you know, I do stuff like that. Um, and that I have 1000 Black Girl books, something I pursue and, and all this work. So um, when it comes to balance, it's really just picking things that bring me joy and also picking things that challenge me. So school is a challenge for me. I know that I'm, you know, I'm articulate. I can do certain things, but I also feel like it's not meant to be super easy. And when you sign yourself up for more advanced classes, you sign yourself up for more challenges. So when it comes to that, I, as I experience school as a challenge, I try to do things that also bring me joy. So having a job that now I learn how to save, I get my debit card, I do all those things, that brings me joy. Then I have 1000 Black Girl Books, which is a combination of both. So it's kind of figuring out that if there are so many things that I have, I'm involved in that I find super challenging and not necessarily as rewarding as I'd wish because you know school is not the funnest thing I do it's not the most exciting thing I do but it is what I do so making sure that I'm balancing that out with FaceTiming my friends or you know my mom's birthday's coming up what are we going to do with her you know making sure that there's enough celebration alongside that is something that's really important for me especially as a teenager so I want to do things that are fun just as much as I want to do things that are hard and still rewarding so making sure that when I have challenges like school that there's always something that will bring me joy that's planned in the future or something that I hope to do and am trying to do at the same time. I think it's fascinating to hear you talk about balance because that's something that we, Sanyin and I have talked quite a bit, you know, how do you, and I think that that's the constant challenge of, of our lives as we go through it, our, our own journeys, how do we keep ourselves balanced, you know, from, from everything, from our, our jobs, our professions, our careers, our opportunities, our family, our loved ones, what we enjoy doing. But as you said, very important is to expose yourself to challenges, things that push you, uh, things that make you sometimes uncomfortable and it ended their heart. So you have to grow, you know, you have to go through that, that process. And it's, um, and that's how, you know, how it continues to go. And, um, but to pursue that balance constantly, to be aware of where you are, where you want to be, how you feel. Um, I think that's very important and it's it's not going to stop now. So it's it's something that you're going to have to go through continuously. And that's how you feel, you know, happy and aware and and mindful, right? So, uh, so that's great that you talk about it at such a young, early age. I know one of my key takeaways from this is find your joy in whatever you're doing the challenges or even the happy moments always find your joy. And so key takeaways, one for the listeners out there, start with a problem that you're trying to solve. And then think also about what other, how many other people might also have this problem. So you're not solving it just for yourself, but you're also solving it for others. Two, don't forget the people who have come before you. Um, they can be family members, they can be mentors, they can be people you meet along the way who help you realize you can do something and that you are enough, you're enough. You know? And then three is the sense of community. I mean, that's a resonant theme we've heard in your story is the power of community, how we have to contribute. A life of significance is contributing to that community um, as well as drawing our resilience and our strength from it. And then four, that it's never, you can start right now. The choice is yours, but the choice is yours to start right now too. You know, you're never too young to start. And that look at a life of significance as a journey of growth. Uh, and, um, and just, uh, and then lastly, understand when you embark on this journey that you may be different. Being different is okay. Being different is okay. It just, uh, it just means different. It doesn't mean better or worse, just different. Um, but it's so important to retain a sense of gratitude and also a sense of perspective and a sense of just getting to help people feel like they matter. And in doing so, that's how we matter. So those are the key takeaways. Are you ready for a lightning round? Just a fun lightning round? I'm nervous, but yes. I <laughs> okay, let me pull up the lightning round questions. Okay, Marley, what is your favorite book? My favorite book is Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson or my own. I always have to say my own. That's right. Very, <laughs> very good. What TV show are you watching nowadays? I just started watching Freaks and Geeks because it came back on Hulu. So we're going to watch that again. Great. What superpower, if you could have any superpower in the world, what superpower do you wish you had? control time or speed up time. Absolutely. Oh <laughs> That's such a good one. Favorite flavor of ice cream? Lactose intolerant. None. I like popsicles. How about um, 
even but there's also vegan vegan ice cream do you have a favorite I, here's the thing that wasn't popular when I was like a kid so I never had it until I was like 10 and by then I wasn't into ice cream so I like popsicles better I always will okay favorite flavor of popsicle then uh lemon or lime or strawberry any of them any of them I like sugar I have very bad sweet tooth so um favorite historical figure uh probably Augusta Baker she was a librarian that helped uh at the New York Public Library she was the first black librarian to hold like a, a large position and she actually came up with 1000 black girl books essentially before I did that she was collecting books for the library and I didn't know who she was until about a year ago but she was doing what I did in the uh, 40s 50s and 60s so oh my gosh we've got to look her up she sounds amazing and all right favorite collegiate basketball team I would say Duke because I feel a little bit of pressure right now <laughs> but my mom went to Temple so Duke is definitely going to be number one for today well, thank you so much, Marley, uh, Pal, and thank you, Pal, for being an amazing co-host. Thank you. That's our amazing. Um, thank you, and we hope to be able to catch up with you again soon. Yeah.